Resources Consulting. And first of all, I would like to thank everyone for making the time to join us today for a conversation about Agile. As you all know, Agile is a buzzword these days. It's a hot topic for many organizations. And if you're new to Agile, you're most likely wrestling with questions like, is our organization really ready to embrace this new methodology? Will our executives support it? Will they be committed to seeing it through to success? Do we have the resources to perform the work in an agile environment and still deliver the same quality of results? So to address some of those questions and to share with you what it looks like to be on the path of embracing agile methodology, we have two fantastic presenters with us today. So we have Kerry Shaw. Uh, Kerry is a 17-year veteran with QBE, and she's the Assistant Vice President of Business Analytics. And she's joined by Rob Keen, who is a long-term veteran of project management and a 10-year veteran of Agile methodology. And Rob is a Senior Project Management Consultant uh, with new resources. So before I hand it over to Rob and Kerry, to introduce themselves, I want to run through a couple of quick logistics. First, um, everyone except uh, the presenters and myself are currently on mute. So please do not unmute yourself unless you have a question to ask. And I would strongly encourage everybody to think about some questions to ask. Rob and Kerry, you have the ability to ask questions virtually via chat throughout the presentation. And you will also have the ability to ask questions verbally at the end of the presentation. And the last piece I will mention is this event is being recorded. So if you have a problem with that, please feel free to disconnect. Otherwise, everybody will receive a copy of the recording after the presentation. So with that, Rob, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Anastasia. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And again, thank you for making the time to join us today. Again, my name is Robert Keen, um, and I'm thrilled to be able to be here with you today to spend some time. Um, I have been with New Resources Consulting for six years. I have uh, been working in Agile environments for approximately 10 years, and I've had the opportunity to implement an Agile methodology at two different organizations that had never worked Agilely before, which means we were starting from scratch. The experiences and lessons learned are different between these two organizations, just as every organization and their cultures are different. Today's conversation blends high-level Agile items for consideration and specific activities for you and your organization to engage in, um, and your firm as they make this agile journey. This is a big change in how you will work, communicate, and deliver a successful incremental and final solution. Carrie, can you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Rob. My name is Carrie Shonoff, and I'm absolutely honored to be part of this conversation with Rob. Thanks also to Don Weber and NRC for bringing us together to talk about one of my favorite topics. As Anastasia mentioned, I've been working for QBE for 17 years, and I've been in my current role for six years as an AVP of business analysis, and I lead an exceptional team of business analysts, if I might say so myself. Um, I've been a big fan of Agile and Scrum since I became a Scrum master in 2008, and at that time, I had a couple of Scrum teams, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I've been an Agile evangelist ever since. And my company is moving towards a global agile approach, which I'm very excited for things to come. So agile, it's, it's an overloaded word, and there are many variations and meanings for this word that can make it confusing at times. I have two teenagers, and this has taught me a few things, but one thing I've noticed is that it's hard to keep up with all of the new phrases acronyms and apps out there. I finally did cave and I got Instagram and Snapchat last year, but I'm still not allowed to hashtag in my house. So my point is, is that there are always new buzzwords, trends, apps, acronyms to learn in this fast paced world. And for Agile, you may have heard some terms like Kanban, Safe, XP, Extreme Programming, and Lean, just to name a few. I would encourage you to look into all of these options. However, our main focus today is going to be on Scrum, and it's something both Rob and I have passion for. Scrum is not an acronym, but rather it's a reference to an event in rugby. In the game, the teams put their heads together and move the ball across the goal line. Our goal is today is to inspire you to implement Agile. Scrum is one way to do that. 
One of my favorite Scrum experts is Mike Cohn from Mountain Goat Software. And Mike has said, without standards of excellence for Agile, anyone can call anything Agile. Speaking for Rob and I, we don't want to be just anyone or anything. We'd like to do an excellent job. And whenever you're going to do something new and you truly want to be effective, you need to have a strategy and a plan. At the very least, you need to have a direction to head in. My uncle Don is a big Dale Carnegie fan, and he always said to us, plan the work and work the plan. So let's talk about strategies and a game plan for you and your company. When you're considering moving to an agile environment, it's important to consider why you're heading in this direction. Over the past 10 years, I've heard a lot of companies use agile buzzwords and phrases and say, we're going agile and we need to have the agile mindset. Agile is definitely trending right now. You might have heard it too, but thought, oh, well, what does that mean? And while it's new, some companies want to cut costs or do more with less. There's more to it than that. So if there's not a clear intent to gain efficiencies and buy-in from executives, business partners, teams, and vendors, it will be an uphill battle for you. I would encourage you to talk to your business stakeholders about if-then scenarios. If we do this, then what will happen? It might help flip the switch for them. For example, what if you said to them, we could increase the amount of enhancements delivered in a shorter period of time without as many defects? Who wouldn't like that? People love examples so they can picture the change in their own lives. It's also important to educate yourselves, read books, talk to people who've done it, go on YouTube. There's plenty of material on the internet. I read a few books about the topic um, and recently went on YouTube to check out the Spotify Agile model. It's fascinating. I would encourage you to dive in and become an expert so it will be easier for you to sell your organization, and you'll be able to set yourselves up for victory. After all, you're proposing a revolution. With any big shift in culture and methodology, it's great if you have a roadmap, a picture of how to get there. You have a better chance at adoption. It's like getting into a car and driving without a map. I know I personally rely heavily on Google Maps, especially when I'm in a new place. So whether you use PowerPoint, Excel, Word, or a whiteboard, it's important to paint a clear picture of your organization. Show your passion for this journey. It will be contagious. When you come up with a plan, a reasonable approach on how to add value by going to an agile methodology, show them examples from other companies. Give them some, them some success stories. Maybe even add options for six months, one year, two year plans on how to implement this. You may want to choose some projects that would be good candidates for Scrum. Get them excited about this new chapter. You also want to make the intangible tangible for your audience with things like speed to market, more adaptability, a stronger presence in the industry you're in because you're able to keep up with market trends. This last year has been tough on almost every industry, and it requires companies to be nimble and think of ideas on how to expand and contract their business segments. Agile projects are designed to try new things, and if they don't work out, little time has been wasted, and they can try a different approach. I'm the type of person who loves to brainstorm on ideas, but I think it's a good idea to keep it in mind that we need to provide data and show our business acumen. Agile methodology was designed to enhance collaboration between teams, increase the level of software quality, increase customer satisfaction, shorten time to market and reduce costs of software development. And it does just that. Make it so that your company has a hard time saying no to moving into the agile world. Now that I've got you excited about Agile and Scrum, I'm going to hand it over to Rob, and he's going to get into more specifics on creating a Scrum framework. Thank you, Carrie. So we are uh, going to begin to start sharing our checklist of items for consideration throughout your firm as you look to implement Scrum foundations in your organization. 
For example, uh, when I showed up at one of my assignments, there were approximately 12 critical issues that needed to be solved. And actually, we could solve six to eight of them by implementing Scrum Foundations into the organization. Some of the problems that we were looking to resolve included, we had eight different spreadsheets of items that needed to be fixed or addressed. There was no visibility uh, into what was currently being worked on. No idea what each team was working on and if there was going to be dependencies or collaboration needed from others. No idea when a working solution would be available to use or even deployed. Who owned these issues? Who could explain what the real issue was and what kind of solution could solve this issue? And so if we take a look at these key pillars, right, or key items, right, when you benefit uh, that you will receive from implementing Scrum Framework, right, is you now get these dedicated and focused teams. So you know exactly which teams are working on what key functionality. If there's other items that are related to that, those could easily be funneled to that same team. When you have your review, right, you obviously get increased visibility to the work and the progress that's being made. You have insights into even what's planned next. The iterative feedback loop, right, that is your review, right? That's the opportunity to connect with your stakeholders. That's your opportunity to start to see what they like, what they don't like, what things need to be done differently. And that continuous improvement is important because that is you on your team, an opportunity for you to get better at how you work effectively as a team to continue to deliver those key be benefits for those stakeholders and the business. It's so important to set expectations to avoid people having the wrong assumptions. Recently, I was watching a lecture of one of my favorite authors, Michael Crichton of Jurassic World fame, and he told a story about setting expectations so that people don't make the wrong assumptions. The story goes something like this. A man asked his friend to take care of his cat while he went on vacation. The friend called him and said, hey, I've got some bad news. The cat got on the roof and we can't get it down. We called the fire department. The cat went up the tree, the cat fell, and the cat is dead. And he said, oh my gosh, how can you tell me in this way? The friend said, well, how should I prepare you? And the man said, well, the first day you should say, the cat is on the roof and we can't get her down. And the second day you call and say, we called the fire department and the cat is in the tree. And the third day you call me and say the cat died. And then I'm prepared. And the friend said, okay, if that's the way you want it, I understand. So the man continues his vacation and the friend calls a week later and says, listen, your mother is on the roof and we can't get her down. So I think we've all made the wrong assumptions at one point or another. And let's remember that. One of the things we want to make sure we clear, we're clear on is establishing roles. The stakeholders are not part of the core Scrum team, but it's critical that they're involved every step of the way. Core team roles are a product owner, and this can be in the business or IT. It's someone with the purse who can make decisions. The Scrum master, we describe them as a servant leader. They lead the team and remove roadblocks. Essentially, the Scrum Master is there to make sure the ship doesn't run aground. The rest of the team can vary, but it usually contains developers, quality assurance analysts or testers, and my favorite group, business analysts. The team is high functioning when it's around three to nine members. It provides a close-knit group and opportunities to cross-train and learn how to help each other finish on time. I do want to highlight another key thing to keep in mind when identifying Scrum team members is the ability for those Scrum team members to wear multiple hats, right? Uh, or in Scrum, they call it becoming kind of T-shaped team members. Ultimately, you want to make sure that your team does not have any sort of single points of failure or choke points. For example, developers can help with testing or QAs can help write requirements and user stories. Having team members that are willing to jump in and play other roles will only make your team more flexible and stronger. Rob and Carrie, we actually have a couple of questions that came in. Uh, the first one is, do you recommend that people get certified in Scrum? I can take that one. Um, uh, there are a lot of places to get agile training and certifications. Um, I'm a certified Scrum master with the Scrum Alliance and um, a certified safe agilist. So, 
I would say certification is one thing, but the actual work is what really counts. Anyone can go to training for three days and become a certified scrum master, but experience is really key. And sometimes you need to search out experience versus waiting for it to come to you. Thank you. The second question is, uh, should project managers be turned into scrum masters automatically when we go to an agile environment? And what are the pros and cons of doing that? Anastasia, I can, I can take that one. So I do think that this is something that most firms do because they think that project management and scrum masters are the same skill set, but I want to highlight that they're not. And I think there's danger in making this automatic pairing. Scrum masters are servant leaders for their development teams. Their goal and focus is helping to make the team successful so they can deliver um, their solution. Project managers are generally task driven, regardless of the impact to a team. Project managers that have kind of a task and control mindset um, are great at making the trains run on time, are generally not great fits for that scrum master role. Um, because again, um, again, the scrum master is that servant leader, and I think it's very important that you have someone that can play a servant type role. Thank you. Training, very, very important here. I do want to highlight that in some cases, right, some of our attendees today, right, Agile might be new to your organization, but it might not be new to some of your employees. Agile and Scrum is a framework, and it's fair to assume that the employees that have been exposed to Agile at different organizations have used the Agile methodology differently. So you do not just have one vision of Agile. That is why we strongly recommend sending everyone through a Scrum Foundation training. There is power in a shared vocabulary. We are using the same terminology in the same way. With shared training, you can think back to the conversations or the exercises where these new terms were used, so we're all using the same vocabulary and all using the same vocabulary in the same way. There is also power in shared examples. When you are struggling to come together as a team or with a specific Scrum event, and refinement comes to mind, um, you can use examples from your training to make your points and ensure that everyone is aligned and make sure that the Scrum events are more valuable. So, the biggest benefits of training um, are momentum for change. You know, we really want to set ourselves up for success. And let me give you an example of that. Some friends and families used to ride bikes across Iowa every summer for a week, and they called it RAGBRAI. And most of the train team would train for months beforehand. But there would always be one or two people who thought, oh, we don't need to train or prepare at all, and they would just wing it when they got there. Midway through the week, those people that didn't prepare and train ahead, they had a hard time, and they struggled to keep up with the others, you know, even cheering them on. But curiously, they were always the people that first arrived at the happy hour tent. So by training, we're, we want to keep up the momentum, and we want to be able to put things into motion faster. If you're going to go on a bike ride, it's important to have committed to having a bike. And it's just as important that teams are committed to work together. And upper management is committed to so supporting teams. Don't skip the step of training. So as we mentioned, there are some key kind of foundational items that um, you know, we should look to put in place, right? To ensure that the Scrum framework has an opportunity to really take hold and, and be effective in your organization. So I'll start to walk through some of these, right? The first one, obviously identifying the key stakeholders. This is really critical to a program or project success because they are your customer and they can help you with your agile journey. So if you're working closely with them and they have visibility and are allowed to provide feedback on what you're producing and delivering for them, the stakeholders can be your biggest champions. The next one, self-organizing teams, right? I do wanna highlight that there are some dangers uh, and what I do with teams initially. So I get the value of empowering people um, to choose who they wanna work with, but I rarely allow this. In business today, if we think about it, right, you do not always get to choose who you work with or even who you work for. And there are valuable lessons that you and your team can learn from working through these struggles to come together as an effective team. And keep in mind, 
when you're putting in the Scrum foundations to begin with, there's already a lot of change going on already from implementing the Scrum framework to learning how to work differently and adapting to change is hard, okay? And we all adapt at different rates. So I remove one of these choices, the whole self-organizing of teams. So there are less decisions that people need to make while we're going through this whole new world of change. But empowering people in their new roles is critical, right? For many organizations um, that are embracing Agile for the first time, they will have people performing roles that they've never played uh, before, right? And it's important to have patience as the person grows into that role. And the organization has resources that are available to coach and mentor those people as they grow into that role. The next one's really critical. It's creating that fail-safe environment. And I really mean kind of in two places, right? Um, at the team and the organization level, right? So have you created an, an environment that allows the team to try new things and learn from the results that occurred? If things don't go well, it's important not to punish the team, but identify the important things to learn from that experience so that way you do not repeat, uh, have a repeat of those things happen again, right? Um, it's also important to try things on a grander scale at the organization level and hold those lessons learned on things that went well, things that didn't go well, and then highlight the items that you plan to try next so everyone is aware of the planned Agile roadmap journey. And last, establishing an Agile center of excellence. And that Agile center of excellence, right, they think about what do we need to create? What are the standards that we need to enforce? What are potentially the problems that are happening at the team level that they can't solve at the team level that we can bring up a level and sort of decide as an organization or as a department and look to remove those impediments? And Carrie, I know you highlighted that you've got some um, pieces that are going on from an Agile Center of Excellence. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, I'm part of the Center for Excellence and QBE in North America. There will be a Center of Excellence for all of our regions across the globe. Uh, and because of our very experiences, there are different ways of doing things. But, you know, if we can find some commonalities across the regions, we're going to be better off as a company. And I'm excited to be on the front lines of doing that. Great. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start to um, highlight some of the key items that your team um, should be getting from each of these events and some of the call outs um, that should be occurring when we make sure that these scrum events are valuable and successful. I do want to highlight this, right? What's the first most important thing, right? And that's get started. Jump into your first sprint. We recommend starting with a sprint zero so your team can start to get the artifacts and other items in place. You never are gonna have enough time to know and understand everything. So you just need to start picking away at the opportunity. So this slide is one that I'll stay on for a little bit. Um, I do wanna highlight that there are five events um, in Sprint. You see Sprint at the top, um, and these can be different durations. I do suggest that all teams consider a similar duration so that everyone's events line up and it reduces the delays or potential impacts if a team is producing an item for another team. We're gonna strongly suggest a sprint duration of two weeks. And the reason why we say two weeks is because when you think about it, right, you've got this iteration loop that's available to you. So what that sets you up for is 26 weeks of feedback. If you went to three week sprints, you'd be down to 17 um, of those events and 17 opp uh, opportunities to get feedback. So again, it just increases that visibility and that opportunity to really make sure that you're in sync and delivering what they need. Sprint planning that's in the upper left. Um, this is your plan or your promise for the next duration of time, the items that you plan to work on. Um, the daily standup that's in the lower uh, left, um, this is, or as daily scrum as it's listed there, um, this is held every day, right? It's time box, it's 15 minutes, it's for your developers and it's for your development team. And it's to make sure that they know the things that they're working on and what they need from others. The review that's in the lower right-hand corner, this is your stakeholders' most important event. This is your opportunity to connect with your stakeholders, show them what's been built, and then get that feedback. Retrospective that's in the upper right, this is your team's most important event. We'll take a moment to talk about some sort of quick definitions, right, as we start to use some of these terms a little more frequently. Definition of ready is a team definition, and it's really to help you understand when an item in your backlog or your list 
which you see kind of listed up there in the upper left. Um, that's when you know it's ready to be worked on. A definition of done that you see kind of called out in the bottom, that is when you know that the, your item that you've worked on is actually complete and ready to be implemented. Now, keep in mind, definition of done's can vary. Um, my recommendation is, is that while it's technically production ready um, and could be deployed to production, maybe having deployed to production in your definition of done doesn't make sense. But again, production ready could be implemented does. Backlog. This is a um, list, right? And a prioritized list at that of the enhancements that you want to make to improve your product. And the sprint backlog, again, is the list that you're actually working on for this given duration. We highlighted two weeks. And then um, you know specifically what your team is working on for that given current sprint. And then increment that's in the lower right-hand corner. That is your deliverable, right? That's your working piece of software and that you could potentially deploy. Again, we don't focus on things like things that are in WIP, right? Things that are work in process aren't of value to us. It's only when they're finally done that I can actually do something with them. That's your increment. So as I mentioned, right, I've had an opportunity to help kind of jumpstart the Agile process using a few different methods, especially at organizations that are starting from scratch. Option one, at one of my assignments, we were able to kind of simulate Scrum events for a month before bringing in an instructor and training everyone on Agile. Ideally, I like to hold option one before you start training. Um, so it allows people to kind of bring some lessons learned. It's kind of bumps and bruises uh, from things and how they tried or things that maybe they simulated that maybe didn't go great. And then you have that train to kind of fall back on and figure out how things could have gone differently. Option two um, is one that I've had great success with. I do want to highlight that it's a full day. So what my option two is, is that you simulate all of the events in a single day and you time box them. Um, and that's going to be really important because when the time is over, the time is over because that's just where you are. So set some ground rules, right? Like let's pretend two week sprints are going to be used. And keep in mind, this will be a long and exhausting day. Um, so for example, here's how I might break up the day. At 8.30 in the morning for like an hour, I provide a scrum overview, kind of like what we're doing now. At 9.30 for two hours, you break into your teams and you start to create your backlog and you identify items for your sprint, right? And so what you're doing is you're really making a list. And you're thinking about, here's all the things with my product that could be different or could be better, right? What needs to get built? What are the pain points that we have? And then you take a moment to kind of order it. And then you kind of refine the what and the why. And then acceptance criteria is important as well, because you need to really understand what needs to be working for us to feel like we've truly built um, this portion of that solution. And then you come back as a group and you just take a moment to review your lists. And so that way everyone has an idea of what your teams came up with. Take a lunch, take a long lunch. Um, come back about 1 p.m. And then for two hours, right, you kind of simulate kind of a sprint planning. And what you're doing there is you're thinking about, hey, what to pull in, how will we accomplish it, the sprint goal or theme that we want to use, and then thinking about the events that you want to have in your calendar, right? Like when would I schedule refinements? When would I start to schedule a review? Well, when do we want to do our planning? And then again, you come back as a group. Now you've got your list and you've got your things that you're thinking about for your next sprint. And from three to four, right, for one hour, this is sort of a combined opportunity for you, right? It's an opportunity for you to share your plan with others, right? Does the team need anything from other teams? Um, are we going to step on anyone's toes if we start to do some of these things? Think about the code that you might be developing, right? There might you know, be some conflicts in who's allowed to be in there. Maybe, you know, when you start to get too many developers in there, there's challenges. And then when we've built what we've kind of planned, right? Could we go production? Could we go to production with that? Could we go live? So sprint planning again, right? Um, again, it's as we talked about, right? What are you pulling in? How will you accomplish it? Keep in mind, you're going to be estimating things as well. So there's the Fibonacci series, which is a 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21 numbering convention, which kind of indicates how things are kind of estimated, right, from a size perspective. I like to think about it differently, right? So you think about it like with fruits, right? What's the size of a grape? What's the size of an apple? What's the size of a pineapple? What's the size of a watermelon? So if you're thinking about the small, medium, large, extra large, so you can sort of have relative sizing to this to give you an idea of, what are the things you're going to be building for a given sprint? And again, a sprint goal or theme is important as well, right? So that way, other people who are curious what your team's working on, they can look at that sentence and have a good sense of what's going to be worked on. 
And then communication is important and how you share that progress that your scrum team is making, right? You can create an email, which includes a sprint goal and the stories. And from a sprint forecasting perspective, I also highlight that you want to make sure that you leave room to grow, right? In case additional stories or additional items are identified to pull in. So sometimes you'll identify things that are stretches. And then after the sprint is ended, right? I kind of use that same email to kind of share a postmortem on how we did on the sprint. And then you can also do things like adding a release burn up or burn down chart, which can sort of um, shed highlight on how a team progressed over the course of that sprint. Daily standups, as I mentioned, right? This event is for the team, developers, QAs, BAs. And you take time to highlight what they're gonna be working on for the day and if they're going to need help from anyone. Ideally, right, I know it's been challenging because we've all had to be remote, but I love having a team that's gathered in a single location. Ideally, I like them standing in front of a wall or in front of a board with physical cards or post-it notes on it. And each team member actually walks up to the wall or the board, they grab a post-it, and then they take a moment to talk about that card and then move it on the wall to show uh, the work that's being done and the progress that's being made and if they need anything from others. So we're gonna take a moment to break these down, but I just wanna again highlight that the sprint review and sprint retrospective um, are, two most, are, are the two most important events, right? The review, um, again, is for the stakeholders. There's visibility, transparency, feedback that you're providing. The retrospective, again, for the scrum teams, how the team gets better. Are there things that we uh, are doing that we should start doing? Are there things that we were doing that we should stop doing? And are there things that are really just working well and we should keep doing, right? And so we'll take a closer look at those two events. So keys to a uh, successful sprint review. And I will say that um, what you're seeing here is kind of some important tenants to me, right? So if you had an opportunity to work with me or you've had an opportunity to be on one of my teams, I really do highlight that these are really, really critical for me. Colors matter. So you'll see that this screen is very, very green, very black. Um, in business, green and black have very positive connotations. Red, not so much. You will never find red on any of my review pieces. And I do want to highlight, right, that during the review, right, if we just take a moment to walk through each of these, right, demonstrating working solutions have power. When you actually show something that's physically built, something I can physically touch, something I can physically use, that's a wow. Telling me about things that you got started or things that you were hoping to build don't have as much value, so you don't talk about those during the review. The next piece, right, the, the PowerPoint that we're using to talk from, right, so we can make sure that we've organized our thoughts, it's not a deliverable. You should be focused on putting things in that are meaningful for you to make sure that you've taken time to really deliver those value statements, which is talked about next, right? So we built this piece of key functionality for you, and here's the benefits you're gonna get from that functionality, right? So those value statements need to be meaningful and also easy to follow, right? The next one, critical. I think we've all been in presentations where you've had this whole word wall, right? And what you find is that people start to actually read all of the words. They're not paying attention to you anymore. So again, think about meaningful pieces to put there that are gonna be helpful for you to deliver that value story, but doesn't um, provide sort of like an epic that you would look to uh, be reading while someone's trying to deliver something. And then again, as I mentioned, colors have meaning, right? Find positive colors. If I'm looking to highlight something on the screen, I might choose like bright blue. Again, no red. Dress rehearsals are another key thing for me. Um, you know, and again, the reason why this is really important for me is it because, again, we're remote. Um, but the other thing that's really critical here is, is that the review really highlights the progress and the benefits that your team is delivering for the organization. So those need to be really solid. They need to be tight. And so what you're doing during those dress rehearsals is, Right? You're talking about how you're delivering those pieces. You're actually walking through the demos so those things have clean transitions. And then you're very comfortable sharing feedback, making tweaks to those particular items, because when the curtain goes up right, and it's review day, right, you know that you've got those pieces solid. The next thing is, again, individuals can be recognized. right? So if you have kudos to share, right? Carrie, you're doing an amazing job. right? Make sure you call those things out. And then challenges right, um, that we need to overcome by being remote. right? 
So sometimes you have those technology pieces. Sometimes you have those transitions from a demo perspective. Doing those rest rehearsals can help you get those things cleaned up so that you're ready for review day. Retrospective. I will say that this is one of my favorite slides. And, and again, it, it's because, right, when you look at the slide, look at them. Look at how happy those people are, right, in the background, right? They are teams in retro. Um, but here's the other thing I like about the retro, right? Uh, I like to think of a retro as an opportunity to receive a gift that I didn't even know I wanted or needed, right? Um, this is your opportunity to provide feedback. Um, but I do want to highlight that it's your team's most important event. And so therefore your feedback should be very team focused and not a potential personal attack on a team member. Um, and so again, when you're providing these things and thinking about them from again, a keep, start, stop uh, perspective, that's important as well. And then find ways to make the retros fun. So for me, I like to incorporate games. So for example, one of my favorite games is Two Truths and a Lie. What you can do is you could focus on a given team member. They could share Two Truths and a Lie. Or when you have a smaller team, what I'm currently doing is I'm having the entire team share Two Truths and a Lie. And we try to guess who the person is and which one's the lie. So again, you get to learn a little bit something about your team members. You get a little more invested in them as a team. And then lastly, right, you're trying to make the event, well, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to get better. It shouldn't be a painful opportunity when you're together, right? So again, look for ways to make that fun. Thanks, Rob, uh, for talking about these important events in a scrum team. Uh, it's critical to have all of these and not skip one. Every sturdy building needs a solid foundation. Um, one of my favorite motivational speakers is Brene Brown, and she talks a lot about how to be great and what an exceptional leader looks like. Um, encouraging your teams to be vulnerable as well as giving them a safe place to talk and also receive feedback. It, it makes a difference, especially in scrum teams. According to Brene, vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. And if I'm putting a team together, I want them to be innovative, creative, and adaptable. So when you move to a more agile environment, clearly there will be change in the way you execute projects. However, one of the things to recognize is that it takes a culture shift to be successful. Let's talk about the shift. Just because the training took place doesn't mean the hard work is done. We've talked about the makeup of a scrum team but it's also important to make sure that they're dedicated to the team, if at all possible. Then when you create a sprint framework, you set up timelines with milestones for stand-ups, retrospectives, and planning sessions. And you put meetings on the calendar, have a simple way to track your work. It might be in Excel, a Kanban board, a Teams channel, or other ticket tracking, um, things like JIRA or Confluence. So make sure the team agrees on the methods of communicating. That's key. It's best if you can do the training close to when you'll be starting up a scrum team. I've shared some videos and agile terms with my team so they can get used to the concepts and the agile ceremonies, but a formal training will happen closer to when we implement the new teams. I'm going to give you another quote by Mike Cohn, and that is, changing practices is one thing, changing minds is quite another. One of the things my business analysts do a lot of, besides document what the business wants, is to do a current and future state analysis. It's so helpful to know where you are and where you're headed, and it helps show progress. It takes time to adapt to change, and sometimes people struggle. Every time you have a stand-up, it's important to have members be transparent with the work they're getting done. A member in one of my scrum teams would tell us a percentage of completion on one of her stories every day. Throughout the sprint, she said, I'm 25% done, I'm 50% done, I'm 75% done. And at the end of the sprint, we discovered she hadn't started the work and I was shocked. While it seems like a performance issue, it was an understanding of a new way of thinking be transparent with what you're working on and tell us the truth no matter how hard it is. We can adjust the work if we need to or chip in and help out. Another term for this is swarming. I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a teammate and she got back on the right track. 
learning new things can be scary and stressful to people. And we may need to make some course corrections with individuals or teams. So look for signs and deal with this head on. Don't be afraid of those tough and sometimes crucial conversations. Okay, so let's all take a deep breath. And so believe it or not, by doing this simple act, we can better control our emotions and reactions. And in my opinion, one of the indicators of a great team that we don't always talk about is emotional intelligence, how we react and show our emotions. It's also referred to as Q. And EQ takes into account the four quadrants that covers self-awareness and management social awareness, covering adaptability and resilience, and our impact to others. This might seem like something that isn't necessary, but when we consider how we're acting and reacting and becoming more aware of triggers and controlling our emotions, we become emotionally intelligent. On a scrum team, you need to be very cohesive. You can imagine what it'd be like to have folks that are extremes and don't know how to relate to people. I'm sure we've all been on a team when someone is a hothead or won't let you get a word in edgewise. Conversely, there can be people that don't speak up because they're afraid their ideas won't be valued. The more cohesive and formidable, formidable team you create, the higher collective EQ you will have. Another way to look at this is composure excellence. Feedback loops are help people deal with their feelings, emotions, conflict resolution, and self-confidence. The good news is that EQ is something we can all get better at. Now that the team has been formed, we know the terms of Scrum, but if we're going to learn to talk like a team, we also need to learn to walk like a team. So ultimately, scrum teams are best when they're co-located in the same room. The energy is amazing. I have to agree with Rob that, you know, being in, in person and have people physically move post-its on the board is really just the way to go. Um, if you have this environment, make the room inviting, colorful, and interesting. You can use colored post-its for the stories on the whiteboards. Um, remote, a lot of us are remote right now due to COVID. And it's harder to keep everyone engaged, but it is doable. We've had lunch and learns, icebreakers, and game nights just to bring the team together and share some laughs. It helps build relationships. And to me, this is a key component to having a great team. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. I do want to highlight that um, the other key things, a couple other key things to keep in mind, right? Patience. Right. Industry averages show that it takes five to 10 sprints for a scrum team to start to have a predictable velocity that you can start to measure against. Right. So think about it. Right. If you're doing two week sprints, that's 10 to 20 weeks or two to five months before you have a team that potentially is high performing. And if you're doing three week sprints, right, that's 15 to 30 weeks or three to seven months. So there needs to be patience, but there also needs to be growth and progress. Right. So you're constantly looking at that to ensure that that's occurring. Team building activities are still important and items should be planned, right? So at times, right, we've turned uh, specific topics into lunch and learns because you want to give not only visibility to kind of what's going on, but you also want to take time to, you know, see if there's other feedback or other ways to think about things. And then also, right, assuming we'll get through this whole remote piece, right, we've also done kind of off-site team building events, um, like an escape room, right? So you're finding fun ways to kind of force people to work together to solve a problem. And then building and coming together as a team, right, has its challenges, as you see, right? Um, there's the whole forming, storming, norming, performing. Um, so being mindful of these different stages. Um, and it's important um, that if you're providing coaching or mentoring during these different stages, that the mentoring and coaching needs to change depending upon the stage that you're actually in. So lastly, I guess I want to highlight that we recommend finding ways to communicate um, those key successes, right? Um, you know, and again, think about ways that you can share some of the things that are happening from that team perspective, right? Um, could be a company or department newsletter, could be presenting at an all-hands session, right? And so uh, those are 
critical things to be thinking about. And so I want to make sure that we take a moment to also talk about, right, we've shared a lot of information today. I want to make sure that, you know, when you leave um, our conversation that you feel like you have um, some good kind of quick actions to be thinking about and taking, right? That you have uh, items that you should be thinking about that maybe aren't as quick to implement, right? So if we think about, right, your product. Now, a lot of people sometimes can sometimes just choose a product that's maybe specific to a specific software application or just one application. But I wanna highlight that a product could be made up of many different applications. So for example, from a warehousing perspective, your product could be defined as outbound trailers from your facility, right? So there's a lot of steps, right? Loading a trailer, pulling the trailer away from the dock to the yard, weighing the trailer, applying a seal to the dock, uh, to the trailer doors, and then checking the tra trailer out of the yard, right? So keep in mind, right, when you're defining your product, right, what is that scope associated with it? And then here's the other key piece, right? Identifying your product owner. So I just indicated with my last example from warehousing perspective, who might understand how all those pieces would play together? And when you think about that product owner, right? Think about the, again, the important role they're gonna play keeping tomorrow in mind as you look to develop and enhance those things, right? So another thing that your organization could start doing is starting to create those job descriptions. So as you start to know that you're gonna head down this agile journey, right? I may not have all these scrum masters in house or product owners in house. And so therefore you wanna create these job descriptions so you're starting to get the type of resource that you're gonna to need to be successful. And then what we talked about, right? If possible, I really love simulating the sprint in that one day. And we talked about how you break it up at 8.30, 9.30, 1 and 3, right? So you can get a jump start on things, right? And then thinking about this from an agile journey perspective, right? Culture change. Thinking about your organization's culture today. What changes do you need to implement to make your Scrum framework successful? What SOPs or interim deliverable documents would also need to be changed? Fail safe environment, right? Have I created an environment where you're comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Are you trying new things to learn and adapt uh, from the team and an organization perspective? And again, that Agile Center of Excellence, right? What do we need to create? What are standards we need to enforce? What types of problems do we need to resolve? So we're all kind of uh, thinking and doing the same things. So we've come come to questions. I think there was one that uh, came into the uh, chat. Oh, a couple now. Yes, so um, Rob, Kerry, um, I think we're ready for questions from the audience. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question uh, verbally. You can also submit your questions via chat. So we'll give it a minute for, the, for you to queue up the questions. Um, while we're doing that, I also wanted to mention uh, that we actually have, um, an event that's coming up next month. So you, if you enjoyed talking about Agile, uh, jo join us next month uh, with the CIO of Sub-Zero, jo Jody McDonnell. So he will be talking about bridging the gap between business and IT. And that's on May 27th, 2021. So um, he really gonna talk about how um, IT should can and should partner with an organization and what does it take to get there. So we'd love to have you there. Um, please join us. So I'm going to stop projecting my screen and then we'll see what we have for the questions. So I noticed one of the questions was from Joanna Stegman from QBE and that was how do you approach agile fundamentals when you have a global team in various time zones? And this is something that we deal with a lot at QBE. We have a lot of resources, um, you know, some development in QA that is in India we also have resources in, in our regions of Europe and um, Australia. So, you know, a lot of time zones to deal with. I know that when teams have had um, the Indian resources, they have had meetings in the morning because it is the end of day and for them in the beginning of the day for us. And so that's been a popular time frame. Um, as far as the uh, the other regions, I know um, the other day I had a me meeting with um, our European folks and the Australian folks, and I guess, I don't know if I drew the short straw or not, but <laughs> it was at 7 a.m. Central for me, and um, so I, it was fine. I, you know, I, I made sure to set an extra alarm, and I got up, and, and it was fine, especially in this remote scenario. Um, you know, we don't have to commute and 
early. So it, it was it was fine. And I think a lot of people have had evening meetings. Um, and I think it's good to trade off, uh, you know. So I think just agreeing on the time frames is a good thing. And then I would also say at QBE, we're lucky enough to have teams. And I think New Resources Consulting does as well. And, you know, harnessing that is um, one of the things that we've tried to do with you can use Kanban boards, you can record meetings, which is always a great idea. And then, um, you know, record the ceremonies if they can't make it. So those are some of the things that I, I think that you can do. Rob, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would piggyback a little on that, Carrie. Uh, 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 I agree with everything that you shared. I think the key thing there is, is that it's important that you're choosing a time when everyone can be involved, right? It allows everyone to have that voice. Sometimes as a consideration or a fallback, um, you could have somebody who is appointed as sort of the speaker um, for that particular group if the timelines potentially don't line up for an entire team to get together. But then at least that one person speaking on behalf of that team could potentially join those pieces. And if that's a struggle, it's still important for that person speaking on behalf of that team to at least share those items so that way they can be considered or thought about uh, from a retrospective perspective. And then think about, are there things that we could be doing differently um, that could potentially aid or help um, that team that is obviously working in a completely different uh, time zone? Great. Thank you. We have a couple other questions. Uh, so one is, how long did it take you before you felt that Scrum was successfully implemented? And I guess question related to that is, what are some of the biggest benefits that you have experienced from successfully implementing a Scrum framework? So Anastasia, I can take that. Um, so I guess what I want to highlight right from a, a timeline perspective is uh, the best answer I can give you is that it varies for every organization. As I mentioned, right? Each organization's journey is different. Each organization is unique. But I will say that if you spend time to ensure that the first review is solid and well-received, right, um, keeping some of my tenants in mind, right, the, the, the slide of those eight beautiful green boxes, um, that um, you will start to see a lot of excitement early and more people will get actively involved early because it feels different. People are happier because you are doing the things that you promised and providing visibility into what is being developed. Um, and then if I think about the benefits, I, I think there's probably three that I maybe would like to call out. And the three are gonna be this, um, that there's more engagement from everyone, right? Stakeholders, team members, leadership. Number two, better communication, right? Uh, because you have visibility to what's being worked on and delivered. You know what questions to potentially ask. You know what are the key things to highlight in a status. And then number three is probably better focus, right? Priorities are understood. The teams are working and focused on the higher priority items rather than potentially the low-hanging fruit. And so um, you can really get a sense of here's the things that we're planning to deliver next and why we're planning to deliver those. Great. Thank you. The next question is, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced when implementing Scrum for the first time? And I'm sure there are probably many, but what are the top one or two that Carrie and Rob, you uh, have experienced starting with Agile? Um, so I, Carrie, if you're okay, I'll start with this and then hand it to you. Um, so I think there are probably three bigger challenges, right? So I wanna highlight that Scrum is new to most of the people that are trying it, right? There are some stronger voices on teams that uh, may try to get the teams to bend to how this person may have been doing Scrum at a different firm rather than embracing how the new firm, right, your firm, uh, wants to run the Scrum teams. Uh, another one is communication, right? Kind of understanding and adapting styles to make sure that everyone understands the plan and the direction. I will highlight that that will always be something that's part of Retro, right? Trying to figure out okay, how can I deliver a better message so you on the team have a better understanding of what we're trying to convey? And then the last one, right, um, which comes up often in a retro very early as well. You'll find very early when you start to implement these things, there are a lot of teams that kind of save their testing for the end of the sprint. And this puts the QA person or that QA team in a real bind, right? So if your team has completed development items early, you should be testing them early and not saving everything for the end, right right before the review. Carrie, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think for me, the some of the biggest challenges, um, besides the ones that you've mentioned, were um, just some behavioral things. Um, like I mentioned before, people being transparent 
Um, change is a big deal. A lot of people had um, varying types of meltdowns. And uh, so that's just something to, to be aware of um, as you go forward, just people dealing with this in, in different ways and just, you know, being upfront with everybody. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Rob. Um, we have just a couple of minutes. I just want to make sure we don't have any questions on the phone. If you'd like to ask a question verbally, feel free to unmute yourself. We'll give it a second. All right. So, Rob, Kerry, thank you very much. It looks like we have no more questions at this point in time. So we really appreciate your insights, your perspectives. I trust you gave lots of ideas and considerations for the audience of things that they can implement within the organizations and their teams, either immediately or later on. So thank you very much for your um, thoughts and your expertise. For the audience, um, thank you for being here. Uh, the last thing that I would ask, um, we value your feedback. So we would really appreciate, uh, there is a link posted in chat. So if you can take just a minute, it literally a couple of questions.